So, um, these lectures are on the statistical properties of CFTs and uh, IRAs. So let me just begin with a few brief words of introduction into the sort of problem uh, that I want to discuss. So, uh, the spectrum of a CFT is naturally organized by spin and twist. Uh, and um, on this picture of the spectrum, we have different techniques and tools that are appropriate for different regimes uh, on the picture. So at high spin and low twist, uh, we have analytic techniques that we could call like cone bootstrap um, and everything that, that, that's related to that. Uh, and that sort, of, that sort of applies, well it can apply all, down to relatively low spin, so maybe, maybe it applies in, in, in some regime like this. Um, down at, so uh, the next technique we could talk about is numerical. So numerical techniques access the spectrum at, at low twist. Um, sorry, the spectrum at, yeah, relatively low twist. So uh, numerics covers this regime, and it also overlaps uh, with uh, the regime that's accessible to the light cone bootstrap, and you can compare the numerics uh, at high spin to the light cone, to the analytics at high spin. Uh, but um, the uh, regime that we're going to be interested in in these lectures is uh, high, high twist, okay, so um, up here. So what can we say uh, about this regime? Uh, anything at all? Well, uh, the answer is yes. There are various ways of accessing uh, what's, going up, what's going on up in this part of the spectrum. Um, there's thermodynamics, for example, tells us uh, about the density of states uh, up in this regime, or if we allow uh, for fluctuations in local thermodynamics, then uh, this regime of the CFT should match on the hydrodynamics. Uh, from a more uh, bootstrap perspective, there are Tiberian methods uh, that tell you about the asymptotics of the density of states or the asymptotics of the OB coefficients, and uh, those refer to the high energy regime. Um, and finally, there's uh, methods from random matrix theory uh, and the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is closely related. Uh, and this is the sort of regime uh, where they apply. So these lectures will be about uh, this part up here, and in particular about the relationship between ETH, uh, random matrix, Tiberian, and conformal field theory. We're going to focus on uh, chaotic observables. So there's a close uh, relationship between random matrix theory and chaos. Um, and um, I won't define now or maybe ever what I mean by chaos, uh, but what I mean is observables that are not protected, or at least not strongly protected, uh, not strongly constrained by uh, supersymmetry and integrability. Um, a key thing that uh, we need to keep in mind in this regime is that, so down, down in this part of the spectrum, uh, in the bootstrap, we often want to know uh, the particular values of scaling dimensions and OPE coefficients. Like there's a list of numbers, that's the data that defines the CFT, and we're trying to find that list. <coughs> Higher in the spectrum, um, well, it would be great if someone could give us that, but that's probably not what we want to do. Because high up in the spectrum, you know, the, number, the number of states is e to the s, s is big, um, and it's probably just 
not practical or particularly useful to try to talk about uh, the, the millions of scaling dimensions and, and, and OP coefficients uh, that exist up in this part of the spectrum. So often uh, what we're interested in is not the individual uh, see if the individual numbers in that list, but the statistics of those numbers. Uh, the kinds of statistics that we might be interested in, the kinds of questions we want to think about, are uh, the statistics of the spectrum. So by statistics of the spectrum, I mean uh, we could talk about the density of states uh, as labeled by spin and dimension, and uh, we could talk about correlations in that density of states. Uh, I'm not going to define this bar just yet. It can mean various things, but for example, in a particular theory, you can look in some, in some window of states in the spectrum, say in a microcanonic ensemble, and talk about the statistics or the average of this quantity in that ensemble. Uh, sorry, in that, in that window. Uh, or you could go to higher moments, uh, etc. So these kinds of observables encode the statistics of the spectrum, like the energy level spacing, for example. In a random matrix theory or chaotic uh, quantum system, there's eigenvalue repulsion, uh, and that should, be, uh, that should show up in, in statistics like this one. Um, for the most part, I'm not going to talk about the statistics of the spectrum uh, for reasons that I'll come to a bit later. Um, I will mostly talk about statistics of matrix elements. So uh, here I just mean OPE coefficients. Um, so statistics of quantities like that one or um, higher moments of the matrix elements. We can also, uh, and often uh, it's useful to think about uh, more complicated, more seemingly more complicated things that repackage these statistics in some uh, way in terms of other observables. Uh, <clears throat> so for example, we could talk about uh, quantities like the partition function squared or a four-point function or other correlation function squared or higher powers of these. Uh, and these package together lots of, uh, well, these package together lots of these more primitive statistics, uh, sometimes in a useful way. This bar uh, could mean an average over uh, nearby states. That's uh, probably really the most familiar one that we, that we use all the time, like in thermodynamics, uh, it, when we talk about something like the microcanonical uh, density of states, rho of E, then uh, what we're really talking about is, well, the true rho of e is the sum of delta functions, but the thermodynamic one uh, is an average in this sense. And this is also uh, what is accessed by methods like the Cardi formula or Tiberian theorems. Um, so we could be averaging over states. We could be averaging over CFTs, like over an actual family of conformal field theories. Um, there are only a few cases where we know how to average over a family of conformal field theories. First of all, you need to have a family. Uh, and second of all, you need to have a measure on that family. Um, so one case where this is very natural is when you have a conformal manifold, and you can average over the, uh, over the conformal manifold. Um, there could also be cases where you have discrete, uh, discrete lists there's some known in, in two dimensions where you have a, a discrete set of CFTs with an actual measure on it, but those are the only examples that I know of. Uh, another thing 
that you could average over uh, is CFT data. Uh, and what I mean by CFT data is the scaling dimensions is averaging over uh, some statistics of scaling dimensions and OBE coefficients. Uh, now, if this is, if these things that you're averaging over satisfy all of the properties of a CFT, then that's just the same as averaging over CFT. So that's not really what I mean. Uh, what I mean is that you can, can choose some ensemble to draw these from. Uh, it's not a full-blown microscopic UV-complete CFT, um, but is like an approximate CFT uh, in some sense that you have to understand. And um, you can draw them from, from that ensemble um, and try to make sense of that. And we're going to talk about um, how to do that in two different ways. Um, good. Okay. So uh, a big part of this problem of thinking about the, the high energy regime and how to treat it statistically is understanding what the right questions are to ask. Okay. So uh, it's, not, it's not clear uh, from the beginning uh, which aspects of the statistics might be uh, something that you'd actually want to say something about or be able to say something about using analytic or numerical methods. Um, so we're looking for questions that are, that are tractable and uh, physically or mathematically interesting, and often we're looking for properties that are universal. So um, properties of, of these statistics that apply uh, across some class of CFTs. Um, in looking for these universal properties, uh, it's going to be very helpful to turn to examples from holography. Um, because um, there's uh, a lot of recent progress on understanding the sort of pseudo-microscopic properties of black holes. Uh, things like the statistics, the energy level statistics, the OPE statistics, um, using holographic duality and by relating this to properties of, of to, by relating this to solutions of Einstein gravity. And in particular, if you can find solutions of uh, of gravity um, that, say, solutions of Einstein gravity that are related to these statistics, then uh, that can guide you toward understanding what the good questions are to ask. Because you know, for, for every, every solution of gravity that you find, it should be the answer to some interesting question uh, in CFT. So um, we're going to sort of use that as a guide. I think a good, uh, an important long-term goal for the bootstrap is to sort of bridge the gap between these various uh, pieces of the spectrum and to uh, combine things like light cone numerics, hydrodynamics, random matrix theory. I think all, th all three of these have overlapping regimes of uh, validity. Um, so you can imagine trying to, trying to understand the most uh, about the CFT by, by sort of patching them together. But this is really a, a relatively new subject that's just uh, getting off the ground, um, and uh, we um, only know how to, how, how to go so far so, so, at this point. Um, OK. Well, I think that's all I want to say about, uh, about introduction, and we can get started. But before we do that, let me just encourage people to jump in. You could just shout out uh, with questions. and. Um, I'm happy to make this uh, interactive and discuss, and I also hope to, to discuss with everyone after uh, in, the, in the breaks and everything. So uh, with that, let me um, start talking about ETH, unless there are any questions before I continue. Are you, are you, are you going to describe later in more, in more detail for each of these what kind of average you are going to pick? For each of these? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Um, you can you can do any of these. You can you can imagine you can try to do any of those averages for any of these observables. I'm mostly going to talk about 
this kind of averaging. Um, and these two kinds of observables. Um, but um, there, there's also been some work done on, 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 on these. These are the, the well, I'll, I'll come to this, but these are harder holographically. Um, they seem to be maybe a little bit less universal, sensitive to the UV completion. Um, yeah. For instance, if you, if you average over nearby states in, a, in a something like the Forkman function or, or the partition function, do you get some correlation? Or uh, yeah, it's not, clear what this, it's not clear what this would mean here. Um, so uh, I guess for this one, I really mean, um, for this one, you really have to do one of, one of these averages. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, I guess I don't, I don't know how they apply that one here. There might be some way of, of, of doing that, but yeah. In, in, in a way, the eight point, like say this is a four point function, the eight point function in some regime, you might be able to sort of think of as a, as a four point function that's been smeared over some intermediate states joining the two four point functions together. Um, maybe that's all I'm thinking of. Other questions? So I want to um, start by reviewing the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, because this is an old idea that underlies a lot of the intuition for random matrix elements. And I'm going to start by talking about this uh, in, ge in, in general. So in a chaotic Regime. Uh, for now, just say we're doing quantum mechanics, not not even quantum field theory, just quantum mechanics. Uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is an ansatz uh, for the matrix elements of operators in the energy basis. So these are energy eigenstates. Um, and O is some <laughs> operator, uh, and it's, well, let's just write it first. So uh, there's a diagonal term proportional to delta Mn, which is O evaluated at energy Em. So what this term means is the microcanonical expectation value. Uh, and energy E. Um, and then there's an off diagonal term, which I'll write this way F of EM, EN, RF. Um, and the important thing here is that this function F is a smooth function of its arguments. And in particular, it depends only on the energies of these states, not on the particular uh, state M and N. And R uh, is a random matrix um, with mean zero and uh, variance one uh, and is approximately a Gaussian random variable. So that is uh, the, the individual elements of the individual RMNs um, are, uh, <coughs> to reading approximation, just drawn from as independent random variables from a Gaussian distribution. Uh, can I have a question? Yes. So when, when you talk about random magnitude, are you considering the, the uh, some QST uh, some, some where it's random happening? No. This is a statement about a particular this is a statement about a fixed theory. It's, it's random, 
it's a it's random in the sense of which states go here. Okay, so you evaluate this as a you evaluate the matrix elements of this in a fixed theory. You get some big matrix, and the statement is that that's a that's that behaves as if it were drawn from a random matrix ensemble. It's one particular draw from a random matrix ensemble. So they're not, yeah, they're not random. They're, it's just a particular list of numbers, but they behave as if they were drawn from this random ensemble. So are you randomly picking the states? And, uh, also this, um, this is a matrix. This is this is some big this is some big matrix um, with all the states in the theory, um, and the the. Uh, the individual elements are, are distributed in this way. So for example, when we multiply these together, uh, when we say we, we if we calculate O squared, then it's a product of two random matrices. And, and using the fact that they're behaving like random matrices, you can calculate the approximate uh, R squared. So that's where you use the fact that it's behaving like a random matrix. Yeah. Do these random matrices have some criterion for being in the ensemble, like their Hermitian or...? Yeah, so, so usually um, if, so if O is, a, is, is, a, is real, then uh, usually people think of these as drawn from the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, uh, if there are no other symmetries. If there's some other symmetries, then you have to pick the appropriate matrix ensemble uh, for the set of symmetries that you have. Yeah? Can you just in words say what to, how do you formalize what it means to look like a random matrix? Because I could draw a zero matrix from the ensemble too. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, a random matrix, a Gaussian random matrix, um, behaves uh, something like this if you average over the ensemble. Um, so this is what I mean when I say that it's, that it's approximately Gaussian, that it's correlated only with itself um, up to corrections that are suppressed by the number of states, e to the minus s. Um, now, this is a statement about the ensemble of random matrices. The question you're asking is, if I have a particular random matrix, how do I tell that it was drawn from an ensemble? Um, I mean, that's always a problem with random numbers, but um, basically what it means is that this gives a good approximation to certain observables in a fixed theory. And part of the problem is understanding what those observables are and, and exactly how to answer your question, but the rough answer is that, uh, that, average, that, that putting a bar over things uh, gives you a good approximation to certain observables. Yeah. Uh, can you explain again what you mean by the chaotic regime? Um, well, sort of. Um, so the the idea of, of chaos in, in a quantum mechanical system is, is not really a unique, well-defined thing. That's part of the problem of, of ETH, is understanding what chaos means in a, in a quantum theory. Um, and to some extent, ETH I guess the thermalization hypothesis um, has become sort of part of the definition of the chaotic regime. Um, but the uh, reason for that, um, there, there isn't like a first principles reason that I can give you for that. It's more that uh, people have accumulated evidence both through uh, analytics, but I think the most convincing evidence for this is really numerical. You know, if people take a simple quantum system like with some uh, particles bouncing around on a, on a lattice or uh, gas in a box with a hole in it or things like that. And they uh, calculate things numerically and um, confirm that, that the ETH is true. The heuristics for, for when it's true um, are that uh, the theory should be chaotic. Okay, so the, 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 the Hamiltonian itself should not have, uh, should not be overly determined by integrability and symmetries. The Hamiltonian, uh, for the way I've, I've written this one, 
the Hamiltonian should be non-degenerate. If there are additional symmetries, you have to account for the symmetries first, and then write down an appropriate Kanzatz. Um, the eigenstates that we're talking about here should be high should be sufficiently high energy eigenstates. You know, this say in a CFT, this will not apply if I just uh, create if I just like insert the 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 some light operator in the Ising model, that's not, a, that's not a high energy state. This is something that applies uh, basically in a regime uh, where you'd expect hydrodynamics or thermodynamics uh, to apply. So um, you want to be talking about states that uh, behave thermodynamically. Um, and finally, uh, this operator O um, should be simple enough. Again, like, what does simple enough mean? That's part of the problem. Uh, but um, clearly, for example, I can't put the Hamiltonian here. If I put the Hamiltonian here, the Hamiltonian uh, just has is just a number um, and is not going to is not going to behave like this. So there are some things that sort of involve the whole like the whole system or uh, are constrained by conservation laws that you that you cannot. Uh, put here, but if O is some simple operator, like a low dimension operator, uh, and you're evaluating this in a high energy state, then that's the kind of situation where we expect the ETH to apply. Do we expect the e to the minus s correct to be state captured by this picture system? Actually? Sorry, to be? The e to the minus s correct. Those? Are these are just outside the ETH, or is there a way to yeah, semantic the... expand? Yeah, these these are outside of ETH. These are these people don't really talk about, um, or or maybe they would call these violations of ETH. It's part of, sort of a matter of terminology. Um, but clearly, if we take this ansatz and plug it in, say, to a four-point function, then we're going to need some correlations in these matrices to to produce a connected four-point function. Um, so there, it can't be. It, it, it can't be that we're that it's that it's uh, truly exactly Gaussian. Okay. Um, now so this isn't quite sorry. how ETH is. Okay. Yes. Well, what does this uh, Algamo average mean in the case of O? In the case of O squared, I think. In, in the case of O, sorry. So you were saying earlier that if you take O squared, the expectation of value of O squared, it should somehow resemble the a uh, normal average that you are yeah. writing on, right? Yeah. Yeah. So can you be more, uh, can you give a little bit more detail about that? Um, okay. So, yeah, I was going to talk about O squared, although, tell me, I, I, I'll just continue and see if, I'll see if I answer your question, otherwise um, ask it again, because I was going to talk about O squared next. Um, so, if you calculate O squared, uh, then this is again an operator, now it's the operator O squared, to which eigenstate thermalization uh, should apply. So self-consistency of the ansatz uh, tells you something about the size of these terms. Because uh, this one, if I evaluate it in the, on the diagonal, um, should be O squared, microcanonical <laughs> expectation value. So this is just uh, applying ETH. Um, to O squared, but now if I if I stick a complete set of states in here um, and plug in uh, ETH in this form into this uh, into calculate O squared, um, then um, what I'm going to find so this sum over states here is the sum over eigenstates, and if we so if we if we pick a if we pick a state M, this pure state M, uh, to have some particular energy, um, then the important contributions here are going to be the nearby states. They're going to be the nearby states uh, in energy. Um, so the important states here um, are there's going to be e to the s terms in this sum which are the nearby states in energy um, that are uh, important for calculating O squared. Um, and so um, if you now, so if you plug in the ETH for O, 
then you're going to have a sum over e to the s terms of uh, this term squared. And that should give you something of order 1. Okay, so you need uh, f. <coughs> so we can estimate the size of this. We have an f squared. Then we have a sum over e to the s terms of r, r. Um, and we need this <coughs> to be something of order 1. Um, and um, then the, uh, if we, ap we apply the, the Gaussian approximation to this r, r, that term um, will just give us an e to the s. So Upshot is that we need these uh, off diagonal matrix elements to be of size e to the minus s over 2. Because we're going to add up uh, e to the s of them squared and get something of order 1. Um, so we can write, without loss of generality, uh, this smooth function f of em en as e to the minus s of e bar over 2 times little f of e bar omega, uh, where e bar is the average of these two energies, a half em plus en, and omega is the difference, em minus en. Um, so this is just another way that, of, of writing it. I haven't really changed anything, because if we could always absorb any, well, I've just, I've just rewritten it by pulling out this factor of e to the minus s over 2. Uh, but this is how it's usually written uh, in order to account for, for this, this size. The fact that I wrote the average energy here as, as opposed to um, some other, comp like just picking em, for example, or we could have picked like uh, a quarter s of em plus a quarter s of en. There's various ways that you could, that you could write this. That's pure convention. Uh, because whatever differences, whatever choice you make there, the differences you can absorb into what you mean by, by little f. Okay, so it's just purely for convenience uh, that we evaluate this prefactor uh, at the average energy. The non-trivial uh, content here is that f of e bar omega for omega near zero um, is order one. That is, it, uh, it doesn't compete with this uh, entropic suppression uh, at low frequencies. If you go to high frequencies, um, then this is way, this is uh, moving off the dominant terms in this sum, and uh, typically this term here is going to be exponentially suppressed at high frequencies. Can I ask you a question? Maybe yeah. I'm misremembering, but I, I thought the diagonal term was usually given in the canonical yeah. average at the fixed temperature, which has the same average energy. Yeah, the, yeah, the difference there is sub the, the difference there is is only a is well, I can't right, remember how. But that's much bigger than e to the minus s, so it cannot just be. Um, you, for the diagonal term, you you have less precision. You are you don't care about. Sir. Yeah, I can't remember which of those is more accurate. I think it might be the micro. Um, yes, uh, the the diagonal terms. I think we only have power law accuracy on the diagonal terms. Um, well, it, at least the distinction between canonical and microcanonical is power law. I, I think one of them might be more accurate than the other for ETH, but I can't remember which. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. When you look at the two-point function, so you have x to minus s error. Is there a way to tell that it came from... So I suppose you have what? Say x to the minus s times error. Is there a way to tell whether it comes from small correction to this uh, the statistics or to just one state that has 
in the previous episode that the controlled by this formula and all. I think you have I think you probably have to look at higher point functions to distinguish between those. I think if you look at higher higher and higher point functions, then then you should be able to distinguish these two. Um, by S, I mean, uh, well, this this S is the microcanonical entropy and energy E, um, and this S is the same thing. It's it's the microcanonical entropy at the t at the energy that dominates these sums, which is the energy of of the external state. Did you think of it as a large number because the density of states is normally more than one? That's uh, sorry. S yeah. S is a large-ish number. That's uh, large. About it. What's large? Are you at high energies or so? Yes. This is large. Yeah. The state. Yeah. The external state here has to be high energy, and that makes this S large. Yeah. Although in practice, I don't think it has to be that large. I think it's really more like e to the s that has to be large. It's the the number of states has to be large. S probably doesn't have to be that large for, for this to for this to get big because people do these checks numerically, right? So so they're not going to large S, they're going to large E to the S number of states. So why did anybody ever write down eigenstate thermalization? So the eigenstate thermalization is not obvious. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wild thing to suggest, and um, it's very surprising that it's true. Um, but let me tell you why, uh, why it was written down, why it might be true. And the intuition comes from uh, thermalization. Okay, so in words, if you uh, start in some state, in some state n, or better yet, let's start in some superposition of states uh, psi, all around some all around some particular energy, or peaked at some particular energy, then uh, if you prepare a quantum system in this pure state, and you look at some simple observable like an expectation value of a one point function then uh, it's reasonable to expect that it should behave, that it, that it should thermalize. So if you have a, a system at high energy with lots of moving parts, uh, then even though it's in a pure state, if you look at it over long times and you allow it to reach some kind of late time equilibrium, uh, then it's reasonable to expect that, uh, that observables should settle down into uh, their thermal expectation values. Uh, and if we write an equation for that, let's look at, a, at the let's look at the expectation value of some operator O as a function of t uh, and average over time from minus big T to big T um, and normalize to make it an average, uh, then you can Just plug in uh, the state sum here. This is the sum over m and n of psi m star psi n o m m um, one over two t integral from minus t to t of e to the i t e m n. And uh, if you go to late times, uh, that is, you average over if you one way of probing the late time behavior is to average over a very large time window. So if you average over a very large time window, then this thing just uh, gives you a delta function, delta mn. So you project onto the diagonal. This just becomes sum over n of psi n squared, O n n. Um, so 
the time average of this, uh, if you take this O of t, you average over time, then uh, you get the diagonal. So um, if you expect a chaotic quantum system, an isolated chaotic quantum system, to thermalize, then uh, you need this time average here uh, to be equal to the microcanonical. Um, so we expect this to be equal to what I call O uh, at energy EM, uh, well, energy E, where that's the, the energy where this state is peaked. Uh, and there's a couple ways that that could happen. Um, one is if, well, one, one way you can clearly uh, achieve this is to just take the diagonal elements of your operator and set every single diagonal matrix element equal to the microcanonical expectation line. That's what ETH says. Uh, so, if we, so if we apply ETH here, it says that this is just given, this is just the expectation value of O, then this term will drop, that'll just come out front, and this will drop out by normalization. So if we apply ETH, then uh, this is true. The, the time average is equal uh, to what we expect. Um, now, um, but that wasn't the only way it could have happened. You know, a, another way that it could have happened is that we could have said, well, maybe the kinds of states that you can actually prepare have very random uh, psi ends. Maybe Maybe the psi ends are all are of states you can actually prepare in a lab are very, are very crazy. Um, and it's the, uh, the averaging effect that you get by, and, and maybe these individual matrix elements are jumping all over the place. Um, but when you actually prepare a state in the lab, it's the smearing against the psi ends uh, that washes away the, the uh, random, the, fact that the ONNs are jumping around and gives you thump, something uh, something smooth that thermalizes at late times. I think that would have been a, another reasonable way for it to work. And uh, when people started studying ETH numerically, they considered both possibilities, and then they did the numerics, and that's just not how quantum mechanics thermalizes. Sorry, what, so, is, what is E here? Uh, e here is... Um, the energy in, in the state stop. Uh, and for that to be the case, we, uh, we're, we're going to pick a state that's peaked at some energy. Yeah? That's a small comment. I think that's exactly how the integrable system thermal. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So in integrable systems, uh, the ETH doesn't apply. Um, these ONNs do jump around. Um, you can you can calculate these matrix elements, say, in the, in the 2D Ising model, for example. Uh, these things all jump around. But it's, and then it's only when you choose a state that's smeared out uh, in energies that you get uh, things, things to behave there. So in integral systems, uh, you get late time equilibrium by preparing uh, states with random weightings. In, uh, Non-integrable chaotic systems, uh, the thermalization occurs eigenstate by eigenstate. And the energy basis is special, obviously, for the state. It's in the energy basis uh, that um, ETH holds. But can I ask a question about the first argument of thermalization? Yeah. So it might be some other possibilities to uh, uh, So suppose you start from some bigger, bigger some energy EM, yeah. then you, for, for this for this term over MN, you also have contribution from EN, which are very close to EM. So, 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 so how, 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 how do you argue that the, the accumulated contribution from uh, the energy nearby can be eliminated by after a very long time? Uh, when this was the infinite time average? Uh -huh. If we do the, I'm doing here an infinite time average. 
and then it truly projects onto the. So you have to accurately transcript the sum and the and the limit to keep persisting. Ah. Um, this is possible. It's subtle, but I think it's true. I think I I, I think we have to. I was picking states where these are peaked. Um, so there's, we could even chop them off somewhere uh, and make this a finite sum, and then, and then I'm free to, to do the switch. Yeah, I, I think I have a similar question, because you're discussing one non-trivial part of ETH, which is why the diagonal terms are so constant. Yeah, yeah. But there's also the other part, which is why the off-diagonal are so small, right? even in very nearby energies. Uh -huh. If you take two consecutive eigenstates already, it's already exponentially small. So can we also, from this thermalization argument, understand why? I, I don't think we can understand. So if you're talking at the level of individual states, I don't think there's an analytic argument I can give you for that. Like, we know, we know that they have to sum up to something of order 1, so we know kind of on average they have to be e to the minus s over 2. But the fact that they are truly individually e to the minus s over 2 is is more a numerical observation than I, I don't think I can give a, an analytic argument. Question is there? So does this argument also cover the randomness? So we, this all works if the f is if the off diagonal elements are, are small, but do they really need to be random? What where did this happen? Well for this thermalization, well good. So um, for th so we should think of this term as being the equilibrium. So this term is about equilibrium, is about the late, the very late time behavior of this state in equilibrium. Um, this term is an, is the non-equilibrium term. Um, so to talk about this term, we shouldn't talk about the infinite time average. We should talk about linear response and hydrodynamics. So this term is related to hydrodynamics, which I'm going to discuss now. Um, can we show that it's truly random? Well, no, you can't, you don't, you, you don't really show ETH. You, you, you guess ETH and then, and then you um, show it's consistent with various other things that you think should be true, like hydrodynamics, as we're about to do. Um, and in cases where you can check it numerically, you check it numerically. But there isn't really a, a first principles way of but so, but for the moment, it's not even necessary. So you're, you're getting yeah. For this, it wasn't even necessary. That's right. Yeah. But for hydro, we are gonna we are gonna make use of it. So, but is it, is it is there a proof for a simple model of this ETH for a set of O's and M's? Uh... Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> because it's only true in theories that you can't solve. <laughs> okay. So. It's a property of chaotic quantum systems, and I think if you're able to derive, if you're able to derive the matrix elements, it won't be true. <laughs> it's like it's uh, <laughs> you're stuck. Yeah. <laughs> There is a paper which shows that if you want to have an other behavior, for example, right, you kind of work when something related to thermalization, and argon cannot be true around. Well, I don't know. I think you mean truly Gaussian, but that, that, that is like this e to the minus s. Both, both is true. Truly Gaussian and truly random. They're different arguments. Well, if you have a, an in, you have a particular draw, I'm not sure if there's a distinction for a particular draw. Truly random means that each argument is uh, is uh, individually drawn, random variable that doesn't have to be dodged. And there is an argument against that as well. Okay. Yeah. I was including that in the e to the minus s term, but maybe you're saying that's no, slightly no, no, slightly. No, 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 no. Okay. It's, it's a yeah. different thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the, the punchline is that argument cannot be random in Yeah. 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 Uh, so in that equation, which of the terms are O dependent and which are O independent, or are all the terms O dependent? Um, like is F and R both O dependent? Yes. Okay. F and R are both O dependent. Good. Yeah. So we're going to talk about these terms now. So uh, these terms, um, well, it depends on exactly how big the energies are and how big the energy differences are. 
but uh, the the most straightforward way to understand these terms is as coming is as coming from hydrodynamics. Um, so if we choose O to be a local operator, uh, then let's talk about the thermal two-point function G sub beta of x, which is one of the partition function trace of e to the minus beta h, uh, O of x, O of zero. Um, then according to ETH, The uh, thermal two-point function should be well should be a good approximation um, to the two-point function in an individual eigenstate M uh, if we choose that uh, if we choose the energy of that eigenstate um, to match the temperature uh, of our thermal state. So this is a state with E M equal to E of beta. Um, now, uh, let's go to momentum space. So, G beta of omega is integral dt e to the minus i omega t m o of x o of zero m. And we can now insert a complete set of states here. And what that's going to do, um, so I'm going to skip a couple steps here and make this an exercise. This is something you could do in a couple lines um, at home. But um, let me just say what's going to happen. So when you plug in, uh, when you put in this complete set of states, you now have a product of, of three point function. Of, three point of matrix elements. Um, and now you can plug in ETH for those matrix elements. Um, so what you're going to get is uh, a product of two of these off diagonal terms, F squared R squared. So this is going to give something like F squared R squared. Um, and then you can uh, apply the fact, you can do the you can calculate R squared using the fact that this is a Gaussian random matrix. Um, and therefore, uh, you can relate G beta of omega, the thermal two-point function, um, to F squared. The smooth function, in other words, this smooth function appearing in, in the off-diagonal term really is just the thermal two-point function. Let me write the exact formula. The exact formula uh, that you can derive um, this way is little f of e omega is the square root of g beta v omega. So little f, remember, was after extracting this e to the minus s over 2. Okay, so after extracting the e to the minus s over 2 factor, um, the smooth function determining the off-diagonal behavior of these matrix elements is just the square root of the thermal two-point function. This, this x is just time? Is this um, uh, let me come back. Yes. Um, I've treated this as if we just had time. So this was just. Um, Everything was, um, I've ignored momentum conservation. Um, if, if we're doing this in QFT, then really we should account for momentum conservation first, because we have to account for all the symmetries first and then apply ETH. Um, so then we'd have to put in some momentum labels on the states and the operator, and we get something a little bit more complicated, but um, it's pretty much the same formula. So in quantum mechanics, I could just think all of X, all of T. Yeah. Yeah. What happens to the mixed uh, um, product of like the first term and the second term when you when um, expand in the complete set of states? Let's see. Um, um, okay, I don't remember off the top of my head. I didn't. I didn't write down all the steps here. Um, you can look at it. 
Is an even um, list the average of that? Yeah. I mean, if we if we're gonna average, does it give the just a mean for zero? I'm sorry, I'm not um, sure. Yeah, I suppose I suppose it does. We should worry about how big the corrections are. Um, I I may have assumed here that the thermal one point function vanishes um, in order to, to to get this result, or we could subtract off the thermal one point function. I think you need that as long as you are fine for me, right? Ah, good. Yeah, that only. Yeah, thanks. That only will contribute at, at omega equals zero. Yeah. Tom, sorry. Can you be a bit slower to the steps from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory? So you just mentioned momentum conservation, but also we might have extended operator in safety. Mm -hmm. So does this APH apply to extended operator, or as uh, should we only focus on? Uh, Lorentz symmetry, how should we deal with symmetry? Can you, can you slow down a bit on this? Yeah, um, yeah, let's see. Um, so, if, if we really wanted to do this in quantum field theory with momentum conservation, then what we should write instead is we should take um, eigenstates with four momentum, we should, we should label states by full momentum. And um, ETH would be a statement about um, the matrix elements uh, like this. And then the off-diagonal term would be labeled not just by energies, but by full momentum. Um, but other than that, it just goes through. We just have to keep track of that full momentum instead of the energy. Now, if it's conformal field theory, then it's then you have additional symmetries to, to worry about, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. But I don't think it's really been worked out in complete in complete detail for conformal field theory. Yeah, it's supposed to work for local operators only. Yeah. Sorry, local O has to be a local operator. No, not necessarily. Um, it has to be a sufficiently simple operator. But um, there are lots of examples where it applies to, to, to things that are not, that go beyond just local operators. Um, it's, not, it's not known exactly to what operators it applies. Um, let me write one more formula here. So uh, this is the thermal Whiteman function, but uh, fluctuation dissipation or uh, just writing down the spectral decomposition of this two-point function uh, relates this um, to the retarded two-point function. So we can also write this as 2 times 1 minus e to the minus theta omega inverse times the imaginary part of gr of omega, the retarded two-point function. Um, and this gr uh, is measuring linear response. Um, so this is fluctuation dissipation. Um, and I'm just writing it to emphasize that, um, so linear response is hydrodynamics. When linear response in, of local operators in quantum field theory is hydrodynamics. Um, so it really is hydrodynamics that's controlling this, uh, this um, the smooth part of the off diagonal term. Now, um, Let's see. How, how strict are we on time? Can I take five more minutes? Sure. Okay. I mean, this is only a dynamic supply of certain regime of Omega, right? Not arbitrary Omega. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's hydrodynamics if Omega is um, small enough. Question about the randomness. Uh, so here we're, we're, we use R squared. So is it correct to say that okay, it's it's a convenient fiction. Like we could this uh, this is just one draw, so it's one matrix, and the idea is that there is uh, some R squared which should be close to the product of the Kronecker delta up to smaller, even smaller corrections. Yes. And these smaller corrections are what power of s? So um, can can this be? 
there, I, I think the corrections in this formula are only 1 over s. Okay. The corrections are, I, I believe, are 1 over s, not exponential in s. If that's your question. I, I don't know what power of s. 1 over some power of s. Okay. Now, um, to finish up today, I just want to say a few words about in CFT. So, um, now the, the matrix elements of some local operator uh, are, of course, the OPE coefficients. Uh, however, in order, to take, in order to talk about ETH, we should take a thermodynamic limit uh, where uh, the volume of the system uh, goes to infinity or at fixed volume, uh, we can take the number of degrees of freedom <coughs> to infinity. So uh, it's in this in a, in a general CFT, uh, the only place where we're pretty confident, where we're really most confident in eigenstate normalization, is in this thermodynamic limit. This limit is taken with fixed. energy density, energy over volume. Okay, so if you think about in radio quantization, um, if you think about ins inserting uh, an operator at the origin and using that to define a state on the sphere, uh, then for, so usually we put the sphere at radius one, uh, in the thermodynamic limit, we need to put the sphere we need to make the sphere bigger and bigger while holding the energy density fixed. Of course, if you fix the operator and uh, take the sphere bigger and bigger, the energy will go down. So the thermodynamic limit is really one where the dimension of the operator goes to infinity. That is, if we, if we fix the size of the, if we, yeah, we imagine taking this sphere to infinity and simultaneously scaling up the dimension of the operator, so that it has fixed energy density. So uh, we need delta m and delta n, uh, the dimension of these two operators, uh, to go to infinity, or to scale uh, with n squared um, if we're talking about a holographic CFT to get a large number of degrees of freedom. So in a conformal field theory, ETH suggests roughly um, that heavy OPE coefficients, so this is heavy light operator, heavy, uh, are given by thermal one-point functions, <coughs> and the light heavy, heavy prime OPE coefficients, these are the off-diagonals, heavy, heavy prime, um, are given by um, smooth functions of the scaling dimensions uh, times random coefficients. So that's the rough idea of what ETH is, is telling you about conformal field theory. Now, um, to really write down a, a, an equation for this, um, you should first account for all the conformal symmetries and then um, understand how to take the thermodynamic limit and translate uh, the result, translate the ETH ansatz into a statement about the OPE coefficients. Um, we're going to go through that in detail in two-dimensional CFT. I'm not aware of a I'm not aware of a formula in the literature that, that does that in higher dimensions, but 
I think um, it's a it's a worthwhile uh, exercise to write that down. Um, but basically, it should it will give us uh, something along those lines. Um, so let me stop here today and take any final questions. If h prime is almost h, if it's really a neighboring a neighbor of h, do we expect that correlation function to be order one or exponentially small? The the that offset that OP coefficient? Yeah, either or in this or in this more general set of things. M it's, and n it's, are really neighbors. We expect we, it to be e to the minus s over two. Exponentially small. An individual matrix element will be or neighbors in state. Like n is one million, one million plus two, it yep. will be already exponentially small. Yep. One million and one million plus point oh one. They're, they're, I mean, the, the states are e to the minus s apart. They're extremely close. But on di ex if you're exactly on diagonal, they're order one. If you're just one off the diagonal, they're e to the minus s over two. Mm -hmm. Can you say the variety instead of the errors of one over s? I thought, like if it's a random matrix averaging thing, you say you have a matrix with some mean invariance and the correction to that are one over the size of whatever number space you're looking at, and that's easier. Well, I was, I was concerned in particular about the diagonal terms, where there's the canonical versus microcanonical one over s's, um, but I'm not certain exactly what the corrections are to the formula that I wrote. For the off diagonal, like when you're not looking at the diagonal, all the hydro stuff, the corrections are equal to one over I'm by yourself. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. If we work at finite omega, then I think I think I agree then. I am pretty sure I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess you will explain this in detail, but uh, just to understand what's naive but what about what I'm thinking. So if you just work with primaries, then this goes through and you just have to be careful with the sentences. Is that the kind of question you were worried about? Um, primaries and descendants are highly correlated. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, that's at least in two dimensions, that's all that we have to worry about. Um, I think that's true in general, but exactly right. Yeah, that's that's what I'm worried about. Primary and descendants. Like if you if you take ETH, say you do ETH on a spin chain that has some SU two symmetry, first you have to Wigner Eckert and and then you apply ETH and it's similar in in CFT. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, not good.